The Letters to the Colossians and Ephesians, Conference Number 3. The second part of Ephesians 3, 1 through 4, 16 consists of three sections. The first, 3, 1 through 13, describes the form and substance of the apostolic ministry. The second, 3, 14 through 19, the presence of Christ in each individual Christian. The third, 4, 1 through 16, the constitution of the church and the order determining the life of her members. Between the second and third sections, a liturgical prayer is inserted, chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. Many commentators believe that not earlier than with this prayer the first part of Ephesians is concluded and that chapters 4 through 6 form the second part of the epistle. Common to the three topics treated in 3.1 through 4.16 is one great theme, revelation and knowledge. The question is answered how, to whom and by whom are the great things made known that have been described in chapters 1 through 2. In the beginning of chapter 3 and again in verse 13 and 4.1, Paul speaks of his captivity. His external and temporal situation, that is, his imprisonment suffered in consequence of his mission work, reflect his internal and external relation to Christ. He is a servant and a captive of Christ. He does not complain of being held in prison by the Romans, because he is not against, but for you Gentiles, as he says. What has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. His suffering is in the service of Christ crucified, and the misery he endures is for all Christians a cause to thank God and to recognize that no price is too high for their salvation. Paul has even better reason than Socrates to accept his plight with grace. The verses 3, 2 through 21 are, as the incomplete sentence 3, 1 and its resumption in 4, 1 show, a digression. In this excursus, Paul first explains what right he has to consider his stance for the Gentiles an authentic expression of his ministry to Christ. The answer is this, 3, 2 through 4, his readers are aware that Paul did not invent what he preached. He did not choose his own way, but was surprised by a manifestation of God which proved to mean a specific appointment. God has revealed to him what earlier was kept secret, that he is gracious to the Gentiles. God's grace is not just a mood, it is a gift. And it is not a gift that kills activity and responsibility, but it gives Paul a job to fulfill and the Gentiles a benefit to receive. The grace given to Paul for the Gentiles makes him a debtor of the Gentiles. He owes to them what God gave him for them. What Paul wrote earlier, either in Ephesians or in other epistles, should bear out his understanding of the secret revealed in Christ. 3, 5 through 6. Paul is not alone in his engagement by revelation for a missionary task. Indeed, in the time before Christ, not even the sons of men, that is, people of the caliber of the prophet Ezekiel, knew the secret of God. But now this secret has been made known to the community of all inspired Christian apostles and prophets. Its substance is this. The bodily descendants of Abraham are no longer the sole members of God's people and the only inheritors and beneficiaries of God's blessing. Gentiles are now adopted. They are as legitimate children in God's household and citizens in God's city as were formerly only the Jews. The legal basis of the pagans' inclusion among God's people is the Messiah Jesus. The legal declaration by which they are adopted is the gospel that is being preached to them. 3, 7 through 9. Paul is an illustration for all men of the powerful effect of revealed grace. The 
the man who has persecuted the church and who therefore readily takes the last seat among other apostles, even among all Christians, a sinner such as he has been taken into the service of the Holy One. He was deigned to publicize what God the Creator of all things had always intended to do. He was to announce that Christ, the Messiah promised to Israel and raised from Israel, so administers the riches of God that the Gentiles are given a full share. Paul demonstrates in person how God makes somebody out of a nobody. The grace of which he knows is far greater than the experience of his personal salvation. It installs him as the authorized herald of good tidings among the nations, and it permits the Gentiles to enjoy the rights of children of God. 3, 10 through 12. The mission begun by Paul is also the mission of the church. Those united in the church do not form a country club of people enjoying for themselves fine privileges, but they are a service agency. Through the church, all powers of this world are to receive a specific information and confirmation, as verse 10 states. The Christians know that the wisdom of the Creator permeates heaven and earth, gives life and salvation, shapes the history of nations and individuals, guides reason and conduct. Wisdom was given to a king such as Solomon and to many a wise woman. Above all, it is incorporated in Jesus Christ. To the omnipotent and gracious wisdom of God, the Church is to bear testimony. Christians fulfill this task as witnesses, so the book of Acts calls them, not as though they could rule the universe, but as humble and faithful followers of Christ and worshippers of God. In 314 through 21, Paul gives an example of the indissoluble combination of mission and worship. First, he says that his own prayer is offered to God in an attitude that was wider spread among Gentiles than Jews. Paul seems to mention his kneeling in order to demonstrate his community with the Gentile believers who are to pray with him to the Father of all visible and invisible groups of creatures. 3.16-19 through 19, Paul's prayer is not for himself. It is solely intercession for others. He asks that through the Spirit and the presence of Christ in their hearts, such strength be given to each Christian that he can grasp two things, the extension of God's grace over the whole universe and the intensity of Christ's love. That man will be perfect who experiences the width and the depth of Christ's love. Reason can neither comprehend nor seize this love. But when God shows love, he gives it so abundantly that man is filled with the fullness of God and his love. This happens when Christ dwells in man's heart through faith, when the Spirit gives strength for growth, when love is accepted as the only solid basis upon which to stand. No one lives without God. And no man can be truly human while caring only for himself. God cares for man. He visits him. He lets him know his all-embracing love and makes him respond to it. This way, true humanity is born. 3.20-21 Just as reason is too limited to grasp God, so prayer will always be incapable of expressing all a man needs or expects from God. Paul prays to God who is a good father and knows better than his children what they need. Why then pray at all? Because the father-child relationship includes such words as please and thank you. Chapter 3 ends with a solemn praise of the father of all. Those united by Christ in the Church offer their praise to God on behalf of the whole creation. 
the church realizes its mission and participates in the apostolic ministry when in word and deed she intercedes for the whole world. If God so loves the world that he gives his son for her, how can Christians try and accede to God while they despise everybody else and leave the world without their testimony to love? The verses 4, 1 to 16, can be called a description either of the constitution of the church or of the basis of ethical conduct. Actually, the order of the church and the essence of morality are treated by Paul as congruous. Verse 1 opens amazingly. While in our society people living in freedom feel entitled to teach morals to the hapless fellows behind prison bars, Paul lifts his voice from prison to instruct the free about proper conduct. In verses 1 through 3, the apostle appeals to a specific dignity conveyed by God upon the Christians. The call of God which has reached them and made them free has an effect similar to an act of knighting or conveying a title of nobility. Not that it is orderly, but the worthy conduct is expected of noblemen or of an elite. Correspondingly, the Pauline admonitions do not resemble laws and statutes, legalistic do's and don'ts. Rather, they are expressing what Christians naturally will do. Just as the Sermon on the Mount is very specific in describing a disciple's life, and yet is not a law, but the evangelical announcement of the kingdom's order, so is Pauline ethics. Only princes are educated this way. What is it that behooves persons of high calling? The sum of what Paul expects according to Ephesians 2-3 through 3, consists of two things. Christians are humble and they maintain unity. Thus they are neither samurais nor competing prima donnas. He who is high can afford to be humble. He who is saved will be recognized by the fact that he placed his fellow man's salvation above his own. Pope John XXIII excelled among many Christians because he combined sincere humility with a quest for true unity. The verses Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 contain a composition of various confessions. Just as in the Trinitarian creeds of the Church, though in reverse order, the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Spirit are distinctly mentioned. The word one, which is found before each one among the key terms of the confession, means much more than a numeral only. He is one who has the power and will to unite many into one. Such an event, attitude or structure is one that draws together in peace and harmony whatever was dispersed and antagonistic. Who is exposed to God's unifying oneness? God is not called father of the Jews and Christians only, though at present only the members of his people call him father but he is called Father of all. Christians worship him whose power, love and work are extended beyond the church. What then is specific of the church? She knows God's secret that is still hidden to many others and she makes in and to the whole world confession of the one loving and all embracing God. A sleeping or dead church has nothing to do with the living God, but is a human institution like others. She may be even more demonic than other structures of society because of her pseudo-religious halo. The one true and living church of Jesus Christ is a confessing church. 7, 4 through 11. The unity of the church must not be confused with uniformity. Just as the chapter 1 Corinthians 12, so these verses affirm that in the church there is ample room for diversity and for the display of specific gifts. The author uses a psalm verse for showing that the crucified and exalted Christ himself equipped the church 
with diverse charismatic leaders. Rabbis explained the same psalm verse as describing Moses' ministry in handing out the law from Mount Sinai. Should the installment of specific ministers mean that church and society are made dependent on a caste of officials called the clergy in order to be properly structured and well nourished with spiritual food? Far be it. The total church has a ministerial function to fulfill. She stands in the service of the Lord who alone fills all things. The task of the apostles, prophets, evangelists, teaching bishops given to the church is neither to feed only their flock nor to expand the power of the church. The outstanding men given by Christ to the church in times past and present are servants who have to instruct and help all church members to fulfill the mission entrusted to the whole church for the benefit of all the world. May ministers and may the church labor, suffer and perish if only grace is attested to all men and all powers on earth. He must increase, but I must decrease. Thus speaketh not only John the Baptist, but also every faithful minister of Christ and the Church as a whole. The second part of Ephesians ends with the verses 4, 13 through 16. In verses 13, the Church is depicted as a company of citizens en route to bid welcome to a visiting king or as a group of wedding guests on their way to meet the bridegroom. The Church expects to meet her Lord who has made her his bride, Jesus Christ. Because of his perfect faith in God and his inexhaustible love of his chosen one, he will crown her with his perfection. Thus the Church is here depicted as a pilgrim people having no perfection of her own but expecting all and everything from Christ alone. He is the capstone toward which she grows. On her way she is troubled by heretics, as for instance the epistles to the Galatians and Colossians show in some detail. But her eyes and her hope are directed towards the true man, Jesus Christ. While expecting for herself a maturity corresponding to his manhood, she gives up babyish play and silly gambling with man-made doctrines. Her life is to grow toward Christ by the strength given her from Christ. She is alive when the truth of God's love is manifested by her in words, in unity, in steady progress, in love. The various gifts and tasks of her many members are not despised or quenched, much more it is essential of the Church that even her weakest members are highly respected. Christ himself cares equally for every part of his body and thereby guarantees diversity in unity and unity in diversity. The Church of which Ephesians speaks is not regimented or streamlined but is a truly ecumenical community of free people. The end of conference number three.